Hey, this is Elliot Einhorn. Welcome to the TalkHouse Podcast. Today I'm joined by... Mick Dawson, Editor-in-Chief of TalkHouse Film. And on this episode, we have Eliza Hitman in conversation with Barry Jenkins. Yes, it's a great conversation recorded the opening weekend of Eliza's new movie, Beach Rats. That was here in New York at Sunshine Cinema. Indeed, and, and thank you to the Sunshine who, who allowed us to record there. These guys are two people I've, I've known for a little bit. They started writing for Talk Has Film around the time that the, the site launched in 2014. And obviously, they're people whose stars have risen considerably in the past year or so. Listeners, you may know of a little movie called Moonlight. Yes, Barry Jenkins had his life sort of radically changed by Moonlight. And Eliza Hittman, now on her second film, uh, Beach Rats, her first film is the excellent It Felt Like Love. Uh, you know, she's somebody who is tremendously talented and whose moment in that Oscar spotlight is hopefully not too far in the future. Now, these two filmmakers go back a ways. They do. They first became good friends in the Cinderich Fellowship back in 2013. Which they call, quote unquote, filmmaker therapy. Yeah, they spent a lot of time on the couch, sort of delving into themselves and their psyches, trying to work out what their second projects were going to be. Interestingly, the things they were working on back then did not come to fruition, and both of them went off in other directions. And the two films they did make, Moonlight and Beach Rats, have these sort of eerie similarities with each other. Tell me about this. Well, for a start, they're, they're coming-of-age movies about young men struggling with their homosexuality, both of which memorably feature romantic moonlit scenes on the beach. Right, and they get into a lot of elements about how to shoot these scenes, everything from how to light the cast to what film to use in this context. Right, and Barry got deep into some, some nerd territory with talking about F-stops, which Eliza would just, she just shut him down on that one. They also talk about the difficulties of working with actors so buff that you have to hide their bodies from the producers. Yeah, this is obviously a stigma that, that you have dealt with. All my life. And, and I, I have too. And, and uh, that's the subject for a whole other podcast. I feel like it's at a deeply personal confessional <laughs> discussion. Anyway, talking of buff man, this was recorded the same night as the Mayweather McGregor fight. And, and Barry started with a, a, a very funny uh, idea of instead of the Mayweather McGregor fight, streaming beach rats to the hundreds of millions of, of very macho men around the world. And it, it certainly would have uh, been kind of interesting for that particular demographic. That certainly would have been helpful. Yeah. <laughs> now, there were some sound issues in the theater and that's reflected a little bit in the podcast. Yeah, which is partly why we didn't capture that, that moment right at the start. The wireless mic system was not always on point. No, but what was always on point, this fantastic conversation. Absolutely. So let's listen to Barry's first question. Let's do it. I kind of know a little bit uh, of the story, but uh, t tell the people uh, how Beach Rats uh, came into existence. Um, I shot another feature in 2013, 2012 called It Felt Like Love, and through the kind of casting process of that film, met a bunch of um, sort of guys from a neighborhood of Brooklyn called Garretson Beach, and it's sort of a forgotten area of the city, and kids from Garretson Beach are called Beach Rats. Um, and they all sort of shared a very similar narrative. They had all sort of lost a parent during to their teenage years and had sort of spiraled downhill. And um, their only kind of uh, opportunities that existed were to like join a union or go into the military or, you know, a lot of them sort of fell into sort of like opiate problems and meth problems. And they were not very nice guys, I would say, and got arrested numerous times during the course of the production. Um, and also while we were shooting, you know, the film, there was like a lot of sort of cruising happening around on the beaches that, you know, sort of shared a similar neighborhood. So that was sort of, you know, some of the inspiration for the story. And um, while I was kind of like looking at their Facebook pages, I pulled an image from one of them that was like a, a selfie pic. And the selfie pic was um, taken in a basement and it was a kid with this kind of bare chest and a flat rim visor that was sort of hiding his face. And it had this sort of palpable tension between something that's like very homoerotic and simultaneously very hyper masculine. And that became kind of the character reference for the lead of the film. And 
So, so did you develop the story uh, with uh, with the actors, like with these kids or with these boys, with these beach rats, I should say? Or no, no, I sort of wrote a more traditional script for the project, and um, I will say, you know, one thing that obviously our films have many thematic similarities, but um, they were both developed in the same incubator. I would yeah, say. yeah. The reason I'm I'm here, it's not just because uh, Moonlight and Beach Rats share certain similarities, but uh, Eliza and I were in this program called the Center Reach Fellowship in 2012, 2013, which I call filmmaker therapy, um, and uh, we were uh, workshopping these projects at the same time. I didn't realize that she was working on Beach Rats. She was working on this other thing that. Um, <laughs> uh, that she's still going to make. And I was working on uh, this other thing, but we were both uh, on this couch in what I will call filmmaker therapy. Um, and then somehow these two films uh, came out of it uh, with these themes that are that are so similar. But, you know... I would also just like to say thank you to everybody from Cinerage who is here, um, and particularly to Philip Anglehorn for being a very unsung hero in the independent film world and supporting a lot of artists who are lost and struggling to find their voice or find their way in between projects. And, you know, I wouldn't have anything really without their support and Paul Mazet who's sitting back there and, you know, Andrew Goldman and Philip Reisler, Philip Engelhorn and Michael Reisler. Yeah, a big round of applause for those people. <laughs> um, uh, because uh, Moonlight wouldn't exist without those people as well. Like I said, it really was filmmaker therapy. And at that point, I didn't think I was ever going to make another film. But over the course of 12 months and many hours on the couch at the Center Reach office, uh, somehow I got, got off my ass and decided to make more they stuff. They sent Barry on many writing retreats and he would check in from, I think you were in Belgium, I don't even remember. Brussels and Berlin, yeah, it was a good time. And then you went off, right? Uh, I did one research trip. Tomato, tomato. We, we have, um, you know, one other sort of commonality, which was that when, when I started making films, I made you know, a short film in graduate school, and I had never submitted it to a, anything to a festival before. I submitted to a festival called Telluride, and then all of a sudden, a friend request came in from Barry Jenkins, and he said, I liked your short, and I was like, maybe I'm going to get into a film festival. <laughs> Um, but, so. but I did see your short at Sundance. Uh, was it Forever? Forever is going to start tonight. Forever is going to start tonight, exactly. Um, so, uh, which is a nice segue because as you're building these films, uh, that short film Forever is going to come tonight. It felt like love. In this film, um, you're, you went to undergrad at Indiana, but you didn't study history or anthropology. No, I studied theater as an undergrad. And, and your films are so theatrical. Oh my goodness. Uh, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> and then you went to Cal Arts, right? Yes. And, uh, and you're Cal Cal Arts work, uh, it's a very interesting program. It's, uh, it's very different than NYU or Columbia. Uh, this is a very strong animation program. Um, and then there's the, the cinema program and there's theory, but it's very emotion-based. I, I wondered how going from Indiana, taking those years off and then going to Cal Arts, how it influenced your aesthetic. Well, I think, you know, I started out, um, you know, trying, being interested in directing plays and a theater background sort of gave me like a foundation in like kind of all classical theater. And I originally wanted to be an actor and couldn't get cast in any productions and just sort of found my way into more kind of avant-garde theater and then didn't really have the, the sort of trust fund to make it as a theater artist in New York and was a preschool teacher for a long time and then, you know, decided I read this wonderful book called On Filmmaking written by Alexander McKendrick and he started the program at CalArts and I decided to sort of try and give it, you know, one last shot. Um, and I think that, you know, CalArts is a very sort of unique film program. It's not formalistic in any way that like... A Columbia or an NYU is in terms of like how it approaches directing. It really is more about sort of exposing filmmakers to sort of world cinema and giving them, you know, a camera and having them shoot landscapes and thinking more about form and the relationship between form and content and just looking at more sort of auteur-based cinema, I would say. Talk about your cinematographer on this project, actually. Uh, you guys do some things uh, with the grain and with the light. 
That's quite interesting. Different cinematographer than shot It Felt Like Love. So talk about this, DP. Yeah, um, this film was shot by a really exceptional veteran French DP named Helene Louvert. Um, and she had shot a few films that I really, really loved by a young Italian female filmmaker named Aleche Rohrwacher. One of them is called Corpo Celeste and the other is called The Wonders. And she had shot um, a Vim Benders film called Pina and, and a Larry Clark film called The Smell of Us. And, you know, had sort of spent a lot of her career shooting films that explored what is youth and, you know, the representation of youth and films that were also shot in sort of special locations and environments. Um, and then, you know, I, I had been sort of a fan of her work and then I noticed that she shot a, an indie film at Sundance called Dark Knight, which um, I also really thought was stunning and formal and beautiful. And I said to the filmmaker, Tim Sutton, I said, how did you get this, you know, woman to shoot your movie? And he said, she's phenomenal and you should just Skype with her. Um, so we began a dialogue about the film and I never met with anybody else and everybody was like are you sure you don't want to like talk to this person or that person and I said no no um and she's been a big mentor and sort of source of inspiration and she's a single mother of five children and she brought her five children over for the shoot and they were exceptionally behaved and um but you know in terms of our like creative dialogue around the film um we were faced with this sort of challenge, as I know that you were also, of how do you light a beach at night? It's a very sort of small, you know, low, low budget independent film. And a lot of the sort of visual references that I had used frontal fill lights. Um, and we kept talking about, you know, like what is this presence of a frontal light? And I started to think about films that I had seen it in and photographs you, you know, mostly see it in. Um, and it felt like almost like a flashlight, shining a light in the darkness and seeing something that you're not supposed to see and catching a glimpse of something that's private or a private moment. And we talked about doing that, you know, as this kind of conceptual sort of handheld lighting strategy for the film. And then when we went to go do, I'll embarrass my producers, we went to do our tech scout, you know, everybody was a little bit nervous. They're like, wait, you're going to light the entire film at night with just like a handheld frontal light. And everybody looked very nervous and Helen very beautifully and eloquently stepped in and she said, we could put a light here and it would be the moon. We could put a light here and it would be the boat. You know, we could put a light here and it would be a street light. And she said, but we will not do any of those things. <laughs> and she said, why? Because, you know, it, it's, it's cinema. So <laughs> we, we... Mic drop. <laughs> Um, you know, we just try to sort of approach the film on its own terms, I guess. Speaking of which, did, was there any discussion about not shooting the film on 16 millimeter? Um, it's become this thing that's synonymous with the Eliza Hitman's or Rouve, however you say it in French. No, you know, <laughs> it felt like Love was shot on a red. And was it? I it thought was, it was 16. No, it was shot on a red epic with some nice Cook lenses. Um, but for this film, I, I don't know, I kept coming back to 16 and, you know, thinking about the kind of anachronistic qualities in the neighborhood and wanting the film to have sort of a timelessness. And also, like, in terms of the lighting, a lot of digital cameras are very light sensitive and we didn't want to let that light in. We wanted to sort of be able to control and shape. Wait, so, so could your producers see uh, the image on set or did you just have to... Were they just like trusting you and, and the French woman? We didn't really even have very good monitors. Oh, so it, it was it. it was a challenge, I would say. And, and were you getting dailies back from the lab or was it like a, a week later, two weeks later? It was about a four day turnaround. So it wasn't, it, there was no instant gratification in the process. And I'm just going to geek out for a second. And, and, and when did you shoot the scenes uh, on the beach when people are walking away from the handheld light? Like at what point in the schedule? Um... I think we saved a lot of that for the end. Meaning you shot it and they couldn't see it until the movie was done. <laughs> Wait, say that again? I'm confused. <laughs> well, if you shot it at the end and the rushes come back right, four right, days later, right. you were wrapped. And it we was were like, wrapped. Oh, well. Um, but, you know, we did camera tests. So we sort of had a feeling, you know, of what it would look and feel like and, you know, tested the brightness of everything and 
um, so there was no mystery in sort of how it would look and feel. What, what else stopped you shoot at? Was it just wide open or? <laughs> what? You, you I, I don't you, remember. You said we were going to do this. Um, and then uh, talk, talk to me about Harris. How'd you find him? Where is he from? Uh, tell the people. The, the lead actor in the film, he's a Londoner. Initially, when I was kind of casting the film, I thought we might be able to like attract a real actor because I'd never really made a movie with a real actor uh, with a name before. And um, we didn't get very far in that process. And Harris came in in like the first round of auditions, actually. Um, and we were all very struck by his performance, but I, I struggled with the idea of casting him because I'm obviously interested in the authenticity of the world, and I was concerned that he wouldn't quite fit into it. Um, but he was a leading man, I would say, and I knew that he would be able to sort of carry um, the weight of the film on his shoulders, and he had a lot of characteristics that I was looking for in the character. And then he also brought new qualities and characteristics that... I didn't imagine. So, so wait, did he send in a tape? or He did made he... a self-tape. Okay. It came in through his L.A. office, and he didn't speak in a British accent. He had figured out that he didn't want to reveal too much about himself and was better to just keep in character, essentially. Yeah, it was a softball question. I assume very few people knew that he was English. So when you said he's from London, everybody's like, oh. <gasps> Which is kind of awesome. Did you plan on shooting uh, so much of his back or because he showed up with just this chiseled physicality that sort of dictated the way you were going to frame him somewhat? It wasn't something that I anticipated and I didn't ask him to take off his shirt in the audition or in the callback, which we did over Skype. Um, and when he initially took off his shirt, I was slightly disappointed <laughs> because I thought it was too self-conscious and it was too too much, I would say. And I, uh, there was a moment of terror where I thought it was going to kind of ruin the movie. Right? So you and I are speaking the same language. Uh -huh. Adela, when, when we auditioned Travante, I literally sent him out and said, put on a, he came up in a tank top. I sent him out and said, put on a sweater because I knew the producers would see the tape and it was too much. Because it's like, you don't, it's just like, the guy's ripped. You don't, you don't, picture that in your head but then he's a phenomenal actor and so and then you it lean becomes it. part of the character and you sort of embrace what it offers and for me it became similar to you mm -hmm. like a shield yeah 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 you know of protective barrier of sort of hiding and tension mm -hmm. and now you're brooklyn born and raised uh the three films of yours that i've seen the short it felt like love and this are all set uh, in Brooklyn. Is that going to continue or? No, I need to get out of Brooklyn. <laughs> Desperately. You know, it, like I, I work in academia and I've taught a lot and I've just sort of used what I have access to, you know, and if I were to write something in Montana or something, it would just ultimately feel like a fantasy. Part of the process for me is just walking around spaces and taking things in. And the process isn't always just sitting at a computer and typing and typing and typing. The process for me is more active and physical and looking around and walking and thinking and watching people play handball and thinking, oh, like, it's an interesting sport. You know, it's cheap. You just go to the store and buy a ball and you find a wall and who are the people playing and what does it sort of say about them and their neighborhood and I don't know just taking those things in and just keep folding them into the narrative and some things work and some things don't like the vape shop is something I walked by and walked in and sat down and you know just kept sort of seeing where you sat where... down next to those guys in the film basically <laughs> What did they say? I think if you walked into that shop, it would look exactly, you know, like it does, you know. Would there be trap music playing or did you put the trap music in? No, it would be playing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, I, I'm getting the signal that I think you have another screening of this film coming up in this same house. I'm going to wrap it up. But I wanted to know, there was a screening uh, at Rooftop in Coney Island, mm -hmm, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, you attended. How was I it? wasn't there. No! I couldn't I'm be there. I'm sorry, Mama. Okay. All right, but, but people in the community have seen the film, mm -hmm, yes? Mm -hmm. I imagine some of those guys whose Facebook page you were on have seen the film, yes? Mm, I don't know. I mean, you know, some our cast members were all there representing the film and their friends and family. Yeah, I'm just curious. Whenever I see a film where I can spot that there are non-actors mm -hmm. who are sort of playing a side of themselves, mm -hmm. but I think when they see this main character, they kind of look around and go, oh, maybe one of us mm -hmm. in a certain way. Mm -hmm. I just imagine it, it opens um, these things. Uh, I mean, them. I think it's definitely something they thought about and we talked about and... 
some of them are here and they've talked about their communities and how sort of impossible it would be and how much, you know, respect that they have for people who are able to live authentic lives and the sort of expectations of being in these areas and how sort of stifling it can be. But they were, I think, excited about the experience of being involved and having participated. All right, and then my last question. So the kid who had the photos on Facebook mm-hmm. that you basically replicated mm-hmm. to put into this film. I don't even know who he is. Has he is. hit you up? He hasn't no, hit you up? No, I don't even know who he is. Are you is. sure? Yes. Are you checking your DMs? <laughs> you should check him. I think he might have hit you up. No, no. Okay. I'm trying to tell you something. <laughs> Y'all didn't get that. It went right over your head. Uh, Eliza Hitman, Beach Rats, please. You guys should get on Twitter right now. Hashtag uh, Mayweather McGregor. Hashtag Beach Rats. Just confuse the fuck out of people, all right? Do that for us. So Barry is here working on a film, I should say, that I'm very excited about. Yeah, that we developed together. So whenever (laughs) you make your next one, they'll be tied too, all right? (laughs) Much love, y'all. That film, If Beale Street Could Talk, based on the novel by James Baldwin, one of my favorites. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that one and anything that Barry does, and Eliza does for that matter. I'm there, first day, front row. So go see Beach Rats right now. Go rent Moonlight, Medicine for Melancholy, It Felt Like Love. Just go check out their entire back catalog. And check out our back catalog. We have recent conversations with Darren Aronofsky and Alejandro Hodorowski. Seth Myers and Senator Al Franken. Courtney Barnett with Chastity Belt. Also go check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We have a great YouTube channel where we've been uploading videos of full podcasts recorded live at the Sono Store. We also have the best website written by the best people, the best filmmakers, the best musicians. Such as Barry Jenkins. And Eliza Hitman. I'm Elia Einhorn. I'm Nick Dawson. Today's conversation was recorded by Charles Mueller. And mixed and co-produced by Mark Yoshizumi. Till next time. I'll see you then.